Thanks, Tom, for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me to the seminar. So I'll be talking about the governance uniformity of the Möbius function in short intervals. And this is joint work with Kaiser Matamaki, Maxim Radzevi, Terry Tal, and Tamar Ziegler. Okay, so the plan I have for this talk is that I'll start by introducing you Charles Conjecture, and then I'll explain the higher order uniformity conjecture, which is the key topic of this talk, and what we can say about that. And then lastly, in the reigning time, I'll tell you a little bit about the proofs. Okay, so at any point, feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions. And so let me start by defining the two key functions in this talk, which are the Möbius function, mu of n, and the Lewell function lambda of n. So mu of n, as you probably know, is defined as minus one to the number of prime factors of n if n is square free and is zero otherwise. And the Lewell function is defined as minus one to the total number of prime factors of n. So in other words, lambda of n never takes the value zero, it's only taking values plus minus one. And the key feature of both of these functions is that they're multiplicative. So mu of m times mu of, mu of mn is mu of m times mu of n for any mn and co-prime, and the same holds for the Lewell function lambda. In fact, that's completely multiplicative. And therefore, it's slightly easier to work with the Lewell function sometimes than with the Möbius function. And so both of these functions are connected to the primes because one can show that obtaining cancellation in sums of the Möbius function is equivalent to the primary theorem. So that's a well-known equivalence. And uh, so one of the most fascinating things about either the Möbius function or the Lewell function is that they appear very much like a random sequence. So if you look at mu of n, you look at, you look at it as, as a sequence of plus minus ones and zeros, it's looking very much like a random sequence, even though it's deterministic. So this is a general principle in our economic theory, which is known as the Möbius randomness law due to Ivanis and Kowalski. So this is not any single conjecture, but rather a family of conjectures, depending on what sort of randomness you're looking for. So for example, one way to state that Möbius is random would be to say that if you look at the partial sums of mu of n, there should be essentially forward cancellation in those. So sums of mu of n up to x to be bounded by x to one half plus epsilon for any epsilon. However, this is known to be equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis, so I won't be able to say anything about that, unfortunately. Um, luckily, there are other notions of randomness that I am able to say something about, namely, so another way to say that mu of n is random would, would be to say that if you look at consecutive values, so you take mu of n, mu of n plus one, mu of n plus two, and so on. So knowing the value of mu of n, if it's a random sequence, should not influence the value of mu of n plus one. So those two things should be independent of each other, consecutive values. And that's indeed a conjecture that was made precise by Chawla in the 1960s. So his conjecture states more, more precisely that if you take any h1 up to hk, this thing shifts, natural numbers, then if you look at a shifty product of the Möbius function, so take uh, copies of Möbius function with different shifts, multiply them together, and take the mean value of that, so you form this kind of correlation average, then this is then to zero as x goes to infinity. So that's a claim. And uh, so the same is true for the Lewell function. So most of the time in this talk, the Möbius and Lewell function are completely interchangeable. I'll mention it if, if in some, some sentence they're not. So in this case, you could just put Lewell function here and it will be an equivalent conjecture. And this is still an open problem. Um, are there any questions at this point? Okay. Okay, so that's Charles' conjecture. And uh, so let me give you another formulation of that, a more combinatorial one, in case there are also combinatorial inclined people in the audience. So, uh, so here's an equivalent formulation 
So it's quite easy to show this equivalence. So what this formula is saying is that if you fix any k and you take some block of length k of plus minus ones, so you take some block and you want to determine how often that block occurs in the infinite loop of the sequence. So how often do you see that block appearing? Well, if the little sequence was truly random, then you would see it appearing exactly two to the minus k proportion of time for every pattern of length k. And that's indeed equivalent to shallow connector, it can be shown. So for example, if we're looking for the pattern plus 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 in the little sequence, that should have probability exactly one over eight of appearing. And indeed that's predicted by the conjecture. Uh, okay, so that's, that's a combinatorial formulation. And you could also state this saying that the Lua function behaves like a Bernoulli random variable. Or if you want to put it in more fancy terms, the Furstenberg system of the Lua function should be uh, the Bernoulli system. And okay, so this is the one of, one of the very, very few places in this talk where it does make a difference whether you work with the Lua function or the Möbius function, because the Möbius function also takes the value zero. And therefore, there would be a three to the k different patterns here. And actually, not all of those would have the same probability because of the zeros. So the non-square free numbers might have some correlations. So it would be slightly more complicated to state this statement for the Möbius function, but it could be stated for that as well, which does look more complicated. OK, so that's a combinatorial version of the conjecture. And, uh, so the question arises then, what's known about Shalos Connector? Now, before 2015, very little was known. Um, one reason being is that this is sort of a parity breaking problem, which is always difficult to approach. But so starting from 20, 2015, there have been several advances. So firstly, Matamaki, Razumi, and Tal proved that Shalos Connector holds on average over different shifts, which, which means that if you take a one up to sk lying inside a box of whose side lengths are chained to infinity, then if you average uh, over those shifts, then total finisher holds. So that's sort of a statement about typical shifts hi. But one would also like to know about individual shifts. So for this, it turns out that it's more convenient, so it's easier to work with logarithmically average correlations which are otherwise the same, except that you add a weight of one over n to your sum. So otherwise it's the uh, Charles connect conjecture, which is add a weight of one over n here. And then we need to renormalize by dividing by log of x. So the trivial bound is one for this quantity. And uh, okay, so this is the logarithmic Charles conjecture, which is slightly easier to approach, but for most practical purposes, solving this would be just as good as solving the original conjecture for example, when it comes to sign patterns, this will be enough to imply that every sign pattern occurs infinitely often in the little sequence in terms of the combinatorial formulation. And so what's known about this? Well, okay, so the case k equals one is completely classical. So that's known to be equivalent to the primary theorem. Um, so the case k equals two is the first non-trivial case. So that was settled by Tao in 2015. And then a few years later, Terry and I settled all the odd order cases of this conjecture. So K being three, five, seven, nine, and so on. And then also there's um, very recent, a very interesting work of Savin and Susterman, who showed that the function field analog of Charles conjecture is true in fixed finite fields, FG of T, where this cube has a certain special form. Okay, so that's basically a short summary of all the known progress on Charles Connector. So let me then give one more formulation of this conjecture in terms of, well, basically our Gorgic theory. So connected to Sarnak's conjecture on Mebius disjointness. So this is also a statement about Mebius randomness. So a third way to state that maybe it's random would be to say that it does not correlate with any sequence of low complexity 
meaning that the correlation of mu with any sequence of low complexity should be small. And what do I mean by low complexity? Well, one way to formulate this would be to say that if an is a sequence of plus minus ones, uh, then a is of low complexity if the number of patterns occurring in the sequence of length k is growing like two to the little of k. So there are a few sign patterns in the sequence. That's what it means to be a flow complexity. And so, well, Sarnash connector has been actively studied in the very theory literature. And uh, so Sarnash himself showed that his conjecture implies, uh, sorry, Charles connector implies his conjecture. But then Tao showed that also Sarnash connector implies the logarithmic version of Charles connector. So in other words, Sarnax and Chalos connectors are almost equivalent. So to get, this gives a sort of algorithmic theory um, formulation of the conjecture, which has also been studied. And so now, well, we have three different formulations of the conjecture, but the question remains, how to attack the even order cases of Chalos connector? So the cases k equals four, six, eight, and so on, which are still open. So how could one approach those? And so a pathway for approaching these cases was opened by a result of Tao from 2016, when he showed that, well, firstly, he saw this equivalence of logarithmic Chawla to logarithmic Sarnak, where logarithmic Sarnak just means adding a weight of one over n to Sarnak's connector. But then he also showed that both of these conjectures are equivalent to what he called the higher order uniformity conjecture for the memory function in short intervals, which is the key topic of this talk. So I'll explain the conjecture to you in a moment. But a key point here is that although this higher order uniformity conjecture is more complicated to state than either of the two conjectures, it's actually easier to make progress on. And we'll make some progress on this. So, um, that's sort of the goal of the talk to explain what this conjecture means and what we can say about that. Are there any questions at this point? Okay. Right. So let me then move on to this high order uniformity conjecture. And uh, since the statement is somewhat complicated, let me start with special cases. So let me start with the following, following very special case which is already an important theorem of mathematical recipe from 2015. So the statement here is that if H is any function that tends to infinity arbitrarily slowly in terms of X, then if you look at the short sum of the Möbius function over this interval from X to X plus H, there's cancellation in the sum, so it's little of H for almost all values of X. So in other words, there are only little of capital X, exceptional values of X up to capital X. So almost all these short sums are small. And they also prove the same result for maybe it's twisted by n to the i t. So mu of n n to the i t also has the same property. Um, okay, so this is a very special case of the higher order uniformity conjecture. Let me then move on to a slightly less special case but it's still not the full version. Um, but for most practical purposes in this talk, the following version will be enough. Uh, so just in case you won't be able to understand the full version, you can stick to this version as well for the rest of the talk. So again, you're given a function h, which tends to infinity, arbitrarily slowly, and you fix any number k, then the claim is that if you again look at the short sum of the Möbius function, but this time you twist it by E of P of N, where P is a polynomial of degree K, and you take the worst possible polynomial. So take the supreme of row polynomials, then still this quantity is a little of H for almost all X. And here E of X is the compact exponential. So this is saying that the Möbius function does not correlate with any sort of local polynomial phases. So, uh, Functions which locally looks like uh, a polynomial phase. 
And so the case k equals zero is the modern regressive theorem, which as I stated. Um, um, the way you've written it, it appears to say that for each x, you take the worst polynomial. Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's Thank right. You. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so k equals zero is the modern regressive theorem. And uh, so if you take p of x to be a monomial here, then you get the following uh, special case. So mu of n is not correlated with e of alpha into the k, uniformly over alpha. And uh, so one reason why this kind of sums are interesting is that, OK, so this kind of sums either for the Lebesgue function or for the for the Mangle function are related to, well, the very Goldbach problem and also to solving linear equations in the primes, so the work of Green and Tau, where they actually need to work with nil sequences and not only with uh, polynomial phases, which is actually also the case for uh, the general case of this higher order uniform conjecture. OK, so this is the conjecture. And uh, so this is still not quite the general case, but now, uh, OK, so let me say one more thing. So about this supremum here, so it's actually important that we have that for every x we're taking the worst possible uh, polynomial, because the case of fixed polynomial. So if p of n is some fixed polynomial, let's say like square root of two n, that was already solved by Mathem Regressive and Tau in earlier work for k equals one, and for higher degree by he and Wang. However, the case where you're taking Diverse polynomial for every interval, as here, is more difficult. And it's also what we need for the application to Charles connector. So for the equivalence to Charles connector, we need to take all this uh, worst possible exponential. So that's a key technical point here. And uh, OK, so now we can give the first full formulation of this conjecture. Uh, OK, may maybe let me first. Um, state the actual theorem in the special case. So what we proved with uh, Kaiser, Max, Terry, and Tamar is that if you fix k, and if, if the interval length h is at least x to the epsilon, for any fixed x epsilon, then this conjecture holds. And also, our result is not only restricted to the Möbius function, we could replace mu by any Multiple function f, which is one bounded and which is non pretentious. And uh, okay, so the only reason why this is not the, uh, not the conjecture on the previous slide is this restriction to h being at least x to the epsilon. And uh, so h is the key parameter here. We would like to decrease that. And actually, in this case of polynomial phases, we were able to show that you could take the smaller value of h being e to the log x to the 5 over 8 plus epsilon. So so much smaller than x to the epsilon, we were able to show. And uh, so how does this compare to previous results? Well, there's a very classical work of Davenport, which handled the case of long intervals, so h equals x, and k being 1, so degree 1 polynomials. Then there's the famous work of Green and Tau, which handled the case of long intervals, h equals x, and degree k being arbitrary, in fact, this is for nil sequences, not only for polynomial phases. And then, as I mentioned, the case k equals zero and h tends to infinity arbitrary slowly is the Mathematic Regressive Theorem. And finally, there was also a recent work of Mathematic Regressive and Tau, which we extend here. So they handled the case k equals one and h being x to the epsilon. So here we can do arbitrary k. Um, right. Any questions at this point? Uh, yeah, sorry. Can what if I replace uh, Mobius with von Mangold and take into account major arcs? What is is it the story different or? Uh, yeah, so the story is different. So our result doesn't hold for for Mangold. Uh, so that's more complicated. Uh, we have some work going on where we're also considering the von Mangold function, but uh, this will be too optimistic in that case to to be able to try to show. So. Uh, we might be able to get some results from, from Mangold, but uh, definitely not for x to the epsilon. So yeah, uh, we do use the multiplicativity of the Möbius function in a crucial way, which means that this result is only for the 
for multi-vector functions, not for the primes. Yeah, yeah I have a question. I'm not yeah. sure if it shouldn't wait till the end. Um, and one way to view this, I mean, if you believe the uh, the Charlo conjecture that mu runs through every sign pattern, and I'm thinking of the conjecture more than your theorem that if just H is really like log X or something, that you're saying that for almost all sign patterns, E to any polynomial will be small, the sum over with those sign patterns. So can you, in your theorem, can you say anything about what sign patterns potentially fail to have little OH? Uh, yeah, in principle, because, uh, so in a moment, I'll describe one application of this to sign patterns of the Lua function. Um, so we can use this result to say something new about how many different patterns occur in the level sequence. So in some sense, this is ruling out some sort of bad behavior for, uh, well, for the sign sequence. It can be com completely arbitrary if it has this kind of property. So uh, yeah, it does have some implications to, to sign patterns. Yeah, I guess I'm just thinking of the, forget, I mean, you said mu is multiplicative, but in some sense, yeah. if you believe the conjecture, this isn't about mu being multiplicative. It's just any sign pattern with e to the p is, you know, little oh, except maybe a few patterns. So I'm just wondering what patterns might fail. Um, right, well, patterns that somehow have a lot of structure in them, like, uh, <laughs> like the yeah. C of E of N has, so sort of low complexity patterns. Uh, I guess, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, anyone I can it's think like of, periodic periodic like one or minus one to the N, but I'm just wondering if there's anything else. Uh, for multiplicative functions? No, so just, mean, are there any other patterns that identifiably you, you can get exponential sums that are large? Um, well, any periodic pattern. Certainly. Yeah. Um, and then sort of any pattern which somehow uh, behaves like a bore set, let's say, like sort of indicator of a bore set. So that would be a pattern which correlates with, uh, with E of alpha and for some alpha. Yeah, I guess you that can just pick your signs to follow the polynomial. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that kind of bore set kind of constructions would be the enemy here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so, so this is a statement um, that we proved. And as I said, this is not still quite the full formulation. So let me now next give you the, um, the full formulation of the conjecture. Um, so this could be stated in terms of Gower's norms. So added to combatorics, which is the topic of the seminar. So, um, so as you probably know, most of you know, the Gower's norms, you, uh, f of u, k of n, for a function f defined on the cycle group z mod n. So they're defined as, okay, so the u1 norm is just the mean value of the absolute value of f. And uh, the u2 norm is counting this kind of uh, patterns weighted by the function f. And then more generally, the uk norm is counting uh, patterns where there are two to the k different terms, sort of vertice vertices of a parallel pipette weighted by the function f. So that's the key quantity in analytic combinatorics. And then this, so you can also define short interval versions of these Gauss norms. So if you have a function f defined on the indices, then you can define the uk norm of it restricted to an interval from x to x plus h by taking, so first you embed this function f into some cyclic group, z mod n. It doesn't really matter which one you take. And then you look at f indicator of this interval, the uk norm of that, and then you just suitably normalize it by a constant. So basically, this is us saying that um, in this, so if f is defined on the indices and you're interested in this kind of short interval norm, then you would just restrict to h1 and h2 being bounded by h, roughly speaking. So that's the short interval Gower's norm. And then the statement of the higher uniformity conjecture is that. If h tends to infinity, up to slowly, and if k is fixed, then the uk norm of the Mavis function over the short interval from x to x plus h is the law of one for almost all values of x. Okay, so that's the statement. And if you know something about Gauss norms, you might already see 
how this implies the previous statement. So the model case of polynomial faces, well, that's because of the inverse term for the Gauss norms, which says that this norm being small is equivalent to maybe it's not correlating with any, well, first of all, polynomial phase, but also with neural sequences. So sort of characters of higher order Fourier analysis. Um, right. So let me on the next slide then state this uh, sort of nil sequence formulation, which is equivalent. Um, so just by using the inverse theorem for the Gauss norms, in other words, you can state this as sort of, uh, well, kind of a similar statement to the previous statement about polynomial phases, but with more complicated phase functions, which are nil sequences. Uh, so if you don't know what nil sequences are, not to worry, we won't need this later in the talk, just for those of you who know what they are. So let A's again tend to infinity arbitrary slowly, and you take some nil manifold, g mod gamma of the degree, degree k. So for concreteness, you could think of one of these examples, in case you are not really familiar with nil, uh, nil manifolds. And then if you take any Lipschitz map f here, which is gamma automorphic, then if you look at the sum of mu of n over the short interval, and you twist it by your nil sequence, and you take the first nil sequence for every interval, then this would still be a little of a's for almost all x. And so this model case of g mod gamma being the torus, well, in this case, you could show that nil sequences are exactly polynomial phases. So if g mod gamma is this torus, then you would get the previous statement about mu not correlating with e of p of n. Or you could take a slightly more uh, exotic example of uh, three by three matrices upper triangle, quotas out by uh, integer matrices of the same form. So this is called the Heisenberg example. And in the case of that you know, manifold, the kind of nil sequences that you would get would be of the form E of alpha n, floor of beta of n. So this kind of bracket polynomials. So in other words, you can sort of think of uh, nil sequences as being this kind of bracket polynomials. So they include all the classical polynomials, but they also include this kind of more uh, sort of exotic objects which have floor functions in them. So this would be a special case. Um, okay. So this is the formulation which is equivalent uh, to the Gower's norm formulation by the inverse theorem. Any questions? Yes, I've got a question. Can you take the supremum or over the like the worst polynomial sequence on the worst nil or on the worst nil, nil manifold? Here you are fixing a nil manifold from the right outset. Um, you take the worst nil manifold even. I'm not sure about that because if the dimension is growing, um, then I guess almost anything could be realized in these nil manifolds. Um, yeah, at least yeah. for our result, I don't think we could do that. Um, yeah. I mean, a fixed degree maybe, for each fixed degree, the worst in manifold of this degree. Maybe there are only like finitely many. Uh, there might many be some. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so I guess at least, even for the inverse theorem for the Gauss norms, I think this is usually the formulation that you fix the nil manifold. Um, yeah, I don't know about varying the nil manifold. Uh, I haven't thought about that. Um, but it's not necessary for the, um, for your uh, higher order informatic uh, picture? No, it's not necessary. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, in fact, there might be some complications. I mean, if you allow to vary over the whole infinite family of nil manifolds, maybe rare things could happen because so many different sequences could be realized. And yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, right, so let me now state our main theorem, which is about this, uh, well, either the neural sequence version or the Gauss norm version. So, uh, so what we proved, again, with Kaiser, Max, Terry, and Tamar, is that if H is at least X to Epsilon, then this higher order uniformity conjecture holds, either in the neural sequence formulation or in the Gauss norm formulation, whichever you prefer. So here, the interval length would be X to the Epsilon, so this is the quantity that you want to decrease, make it as small as possible. And again, we can deal with other multiple functions as well, not only the Mebius function. 
And so, so the parameter h here is what we want to decrease. Uh, as I said, at least in the case of polynomial phases, we could have the smaller value of e to the log x to the 5 over 8 extracted from our proof. In this more general case, we didn't work it out because, um, well, the proof is already quite complicated. Uh, we believe it should be doable, but we didn't uh, take it carefully. Um, but so um, now the question arises, what does this imply about Charles connecture? So as I said, if you could take h tend to infinity arbitrary slowly, then by Tau's equivalence, this would imply Charles connecture. Uh, and in fact, one could show that if you could just take h of x to be not arbitrary slowly growing, but growing like log to the epsilon, that would already suffice for the logarithmic Charles connector. Uh, now we don't get that far. We got up to x to the epsilon or slightly smaller, um, but there are still applications. So this is already uh, enough to imply several interesting applications about uh, maybe some label sequences. So firstly, we were able to say something about the sign patterns of the label sequence. So the word complexity of the sequence relating to the combinatorial formation of Charles connector. And secondly, we're able to prove a theorem about polynomial patterns weighted by the Mebius function, which includes as a special case, a new average version of Charles connector. Um, okay, so let me detail those applications to you, um, starting with the word complexity. So uh, let me denote by S of K, the number of length K patterns that, occur, that occur in the little sequence. So if Charles connection was true, then every pattern of every length should occur in the little sequence and often, but we don't still know that. We're quite far from knowing that. So Terry and I showed that uh, all the two to the K different patterns occur infinitely often for K at most four. And for patterns of length five, we were only uh, able to get a lower bound of 24 out of 32. Um, when it comes to asymptotics, Francis Kanakis and Host were the first to prove that S of K grows super linearly. So even that is highly non-trivial. And then this was improved to quadratic growth by McNamara. And as I said, Charles connector would imply that S of K is two to the K, meaning that every single pattern occurs infinitely often in the Lewis sequence. Um, so using our main theorem about higher order uniformity, we were able to improve on this uh, quadratic growth. So we were able to boost that to uh, faster than any polynomial growth. So super polynomial growth, for uh, S of K, so the number of patterns of length K in the little sequence. So it grows faster than any K to the power A. And uh, so this is connected to Sarnak's conjecture in a way because Sarnak key, uh, highlighted a key special case of his conjecture, uh, which is a statement that the little function has positive entropy, which could be stated more combinatorially as saying essentially that S of k grows faster than c to the power k for some c. So this is certainly a special case of Charles connector, but it's an interesting one. So our bound makes some progress on this, although it doesn't achieve, achieve this uh, exponential growth. Okay, so this is what we were able to say about sign patterns of the level function. And then the other application to average form of Charles connector um, so we were able to show that if you look at, if you take this correlation average of the Lewell function, which appears in Charles connector, so you take the shifts uh, 0, h, 2, h, so on k times h, and you average over h up to x, x to the epsilon, then there's cancellation in, in this. So the case h being bounded would correspond to Charles connector, and you want to make h here as small as possible in this average. And how does this compare to the previous average form of Charles connector by Matamaki, Razumi, and Tal? Well, they could take uh, arbitrary short averages, but they had to take a k-dimensional average. So they had to average over uh, different shifts, h1, h2, hk, 
in every single uh, shift here. Whereas we can take all of this H's to be uh, multiples of each other. So there's only one averaging parameter here, which makes it more difficult. Uh, and you could also interpret this as saying that we're counting here narrow arithmetic progressions, narrow because of this restriction to small h, weighted by the little function. Okay. So this is our average version of Charles Connector. Uh, any questions at this point? Okay. Um, so as I said, this is a special case of something about uh, polynomial patterns. So if you have any polynomials P1 of PK uh, with initial coefficients and with PI minus PJ being non-constant, then there's the famous polynomial Zemmeri theorem, which states that as long as you have a function f, which has positive lower density, then if you're counting this kind of polynomial patterns, n plus p1 of h, n plus pk of h, weighted by your function f, then you have a lot of these patterns. However, this doesn't give you any asymptotics, only a lower bound. So you could then ask, for what interesting functions can we give an asymptotic for the polynomial patterns? And so Tau and Ziegler were able to show that if f is either the full Mangle function or the Liouville function, then we do have an asymptotic formula, not only a lower bound for these polynomial patterns, provided that an extra condition holds, namely that the highest degree coefficients of all of these pi are distinct. So that's sort of the uh, true compacted zero case, which is easier than the zero case. And now using our main theorem, we're able to uh, drop this extra restriction on the polynomials and to just say that if you have arbitrary polynomials of degree at most d with the differences being non-constant, then we do have, uh, well, asymptotic in the sense of getting cancellation. So uh, we get cancellation in polynomial averages weighted by the Lua function. And also we can take this parameter, so here's this one over d, uh, we can also take this smaller, which means sort of counting narrow, uh, uh, narrow polynomial progressions, which is slightly more difficult as well. Okay, and this contains a little case. If you take P1 of H to be H and PK of H to be K times H, it contains a previous statement about average Chala. Okay, so those are the applications. Um, are there any questions? Right, so then let me uh, tell you a bit about the proof. Um, now it is a lot, somewhat long argument, so uh, the following is a simplification definitely of what we're doing, but uh, let me sketch you the proof of the special case of uh, polynomial phases. So this statement, which for k equals one was established in this earlier work of Madhubi Gersing et al. And then let me also briefly describe the extra difficulties that we encountered in the case of nil sequences. So there are some extra difficulties there that arise. Okay, so the starting point of the argument is that, okay, so for every x, take the worst possible alpha of x. So take alpha of x such that this exponential sum is maximal. And now, if we're assuming that this doesn't hold, then this sum with alpha of x would be bigger and bigger than h for most values of x and for some function alpha of x. And the certainty here is to uh, obtain some structure on this alpha of x. So we want to show that using the multiplicativity of the Möbius function, if alpha of x is this function, it needs to have some structure. Namely, it needs to satisfy a functional equation of a certain kind. So that's the first step. And then the second step is that using some graph theory, we're able to analyze this functional equation to solve for that alpha of x. So we can show that alpha of x has a very special form. And then the final step is using the matamagi residue theorem to refute this uh, very special form of alpha of x from appearing. And therefore, this is not possible. And therefore, we get this conclusion. Um, 
Okay, so that's a very rough summary. Summary. Uh, let me slightly uh, elaborate on these things, starting with the functional equation. So how do we obtain that? Uh, well, let me consider an easier model case. Let me just say that, uh, assume that the sum is actually almost equal to h for most values of x. Uh, I won't exactly define what I mean by almost equal, but you could think of a sort of 99% equivalence of this instead of like 1% equivalence, which is the actual case that we need to handle, and which is a bit more difficult, but this is sort of two uh, fixed ideas. Now, if the sum was really large, almost equal to h for most values of x, what it will mean, it will mean that mu of n is basically equal to e of alpha x n to the k plus beta of x for most values of n in the short interval, and for most short intervals x. And then the key observation is that, so we use the multiplicativity of mu. So if n is p times m for a small prime p, then note that, okay, so e of alpha, f, alpha x n to the k plus beta of x is almost equal to mu of n, but mu of n is equal to minus mu of m, which is if m, n and m are typical numbers, then this would be equal to this quantity here. And therefore also, the left hand side, so this e of alpha x n to the k, should be correlated with this e of alpha x over p m to the k. Now, in the general case of just having 1% correlation and not 99% correlation, this is somewhat more difficult, so we need to use Turan Kobilius here. But, anyways, this is sort of the very rough idea. Um, so, what this implies then is that, well, if two exponential phases correlate with each other, then this uh, leading coefficients need to be essentially the same. So that's comparing the leading coefficients on both sides of this equation. We get that alpha of x needs to be almost equal to alpha of x over p divided by p to the k modulo one. For most values of x and for most small primes p less than let's say h to the epsilon. And this now is an approximate functional equation for alpha of x. So now alpha of x is no longer arbitrary. We have some structure for it, which we want to analyze. And the question is, what are the solutions to this functional equation? Uh, well, clearly, if alpha of x is t over x to the k, that is a solution. And the claim is that these are actually the only solutions up to small perturbations. And the difficulty here is that this is only uh, I mean, this is not, not a real functional equation. This is only approximately equal, and also this is only for most x and p. So you can't say that it's for every single x and p, which makes make things easier. Uh, so that's sort of the difficulty here. But so now we have this functional equation, and then we want to analyze that to solve for it. And so, um, so here I wrote the functional equation again. And then if I make a substitution, so if I write t of x, as alpha of x times x to the k. And if I apply this relation twice, I get this kind of invariance relation for this new function t of x. So t of p over qx should be almost equal to t of x for most values of x and for most p and q, small primes. And in terms of this new function t of x, we want to show that t of x is almost constant uh, for some, some constant t naught for most values of x. So in the 1% case, we would just want t of x to be constant, let's say like 0.1% uh, of the time. That would suffice for what we want. And so the way to approach this uh, is to interpret, interpret this as sort of a graph theory problem. So we look at the Cayley graph of the rational numbers uh, suitably truncated so we take as our vertices of the graph, the initials up to x, so one, two, three, so on, up to x, and then we connect x and y whenever x is equal to p over q times y for some small primes p and q. So those are our connections in this graph. And uh, so we know that this function t is constant along this graph. So as long as x and y are connected by a vertex, uh, sorry, by an edge, uh, then t of x is roughly equal to t of y. Uh, 
And the key claim here is that this graph G that we formed is essentially an ex expander graph. So it's highly connected. There's a lot of different connections between almost any vertices. So there's short paths between almost any two vertices uh, in this graph, which then, okay, so this is proved using some Fourier analysis. So here we use derivative polynomials. Uh, so this is already in the work of Madhavi Garcia and Tal. Um, and this is also one of the places where the restriction on H comes in the proof. So because of this uh, multiplicative Fourier analysis, we can't take H to be too small in this proof. It needs to be at least something like e to the log x to the power of 5 over 8. And uh, so, so once we show this uh, expander property, well then, if T is a function which is constant along a graph G, and if G is an expander graph, then necessarily T of X needs to be essentially constant because almost everything is connected in the graph and T of X is equal to T of Y whenever X and Y are connected. So it means that T needs to be more or less constant as well. And therefore, translating back to this original function alpha of X, we can say, then say that alpha of X is essentially T naught divided by X to the K for some T naught. Okay. So this is the graph theory part of the argument. And then, so now we have this very special form for alpha of x. And how can we refute this form? Um, okay, so now we have, just to recall, mu of n is essentially equal to e of alpha x and the decay plus beta of x, where alpha of x is of this form. Now the key thing to note here is that by Taylor expansion, uh, this e of t naught and the decay over x to the k it's basically equal to an Archimedean character n to the two pi i k t naught. So this is just a Taylor expansion on the short interval. And therefore, we actually get that mu of n correlates with an Archimedean character n to the i t on short intervals. However, this uh, contradicts the Matamaki recipe theorem, which I stated some, some slides earlier. So as I said, that theorem also holds for mu of n times n to the it, not only for mu of n. So it's showing that mu of n times n to the it cannot be constant or uh, it, it needs to have mean value zero in almost all intervals. And therefore, that's a contradiction to this statement. And this means that not just alpha of x exists, which is what we wanted. Okay, so that's the rough uh, outline of the proof with some details left out. And uh, finally, let me say a little bit about the additional difficulties that we encountered in the nil sequence case. So there are some genuine difficulties there. Uh, so firstly, we have to translate this argument to the uh, language of higher order Fourier analysis, which adds an extra layer of complication. In particular, we have to do quite a bit of uh, sort of quantitative nil algebra arguments. However, the, the basic structure of the argument is the same. It's just the details that are more complicated. Um, and the main difficulty that we encountered here is that actually, so, so the main enemy in the proof is that what if there is some uh, sort of a locally polynomial phase that is approximately multiplicative? So if some polynomial phase could look like a multiplicative function, then it will be very difficult to rule out that the polynomial phase is not equal to the Möbius function. And actually in the case of nil sequences, it is possible for some nil sequences to approximately look like multiplicative functions, which is kind of a surprise. So more precisely, if you take uh, p x of t to be a Taylor polynomial of log of t of sufficient in the high order on the interval from x to x plus h, and then if you take f of n to be this kind of bracket polynomial. So this is a nil sequence, first of all, and secondly, uh, because p x of n is the Taylor polynomial of log, this is almost equal to uh, e of log of t1 log n, t2 log n. And because log is an additive function, you can see that uh, for certain values of p and q, this is almost multiplicative. However, it's not for all values of p and q, only for some, which is good for us. But uh, so we need to rule out here uh, this kind of bad behavior, so multiplicativity of this kind of sequences happening for too many values of P and Q. So we need to show that 
no matter what your neural sequence is, you can't have too many values of P and Q, for which you have this multiplicativity relation holding. Because if you had this holding all the time, then it would be hard to rule out this function correlating with multiplicative functions. And that requires some uh, extra work uh, to handle this more general case for neural sequences. Okay, uh, I think that's all what I wanted to say. Uh, so thanks a lot. <laughs>